Well, welcome, church. So great that we can continue to gather in this way, coming together online through the use of technology. We know it's been a long time. We know we haven't been able to gather for a full year now. It was a year ago that we first learned of the global pandemic and the impact that it was going to have on our lives, our workplaces, uh, our interactions with each other, our community, our church, just coming together for corporate worship. But we know that there's light at the end of the tunnel. We know the vaccines are on the way. We know there's a good news story ahead of us. And there will be a time that we'll be able to gather for corporate worship again, giving handshakes, giving hugs, raising our voices together. But we'll celebrate technology and the ability we have to be here today to be able to engage in worship. So the first song we're going to sing today is going to talk about God's faithfulness. It's a testimony. For those of us that follow Christ, we have a story we want to show the good, share, the good news. And that's our testimony. In this song, the chorus talks about that testimony. It says, this is my testimony from death to life. Because grace rewrote my story, I'll testify. By Jesus Christ, the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. Join us if you will. registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders I have resurrection power but the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven yeah my praise belongs to you forever this is my testimony Grace rewrote my story, I'll testify, by Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified, this is my testimony, this is my testimony. of the Spirit, Son, and Father, our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony from death to life, because grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified.
Oh, sorry. Good morning, Kids Questers, and welcome back for another week. Thanks for joining us. Today, we are going to talk about Actually, how Madeline, we... Madeline, I have an idea. We've been so easy on these guys. Let's see if Kids Questers, you can guess what today's theme is going to be. Oh, good Who thinks idea. They can do it? Good idea, Julia. Okay, so here's how this game is going to work. Put your thinking caps on, Kids Questers. We're gonna show a picture up on screen and you have to be the first one in your group to guess what it is. But it's not gonna be that easy. The first picture you're gonna see is gonna be super blurry and then it's gonna get clearer and clearer and clearer mm -hmm. until you can guess what's on screen. Who's ready? basically been my own bread maker. I started baking sourdough at the beginning of the pandemic and let me tell you, it is amazing. So okay. if we're gonna be talking about bread today, why don't I give you a quick little demo oh, about it? You know what? That sounds like it would be so much fun. Maybe for another time, right Kids Questers? Just go with it. But the bread that we're gonna be talking about today is not bread bread. It's a different kind of bread. Um, what kind of bread is it? Well, remember that just last week, we told you Kids Questers that for the next few weeks, we're gonna be talking about who Jesus said that he is. And we said that we were gonna be looking at the I am statements that he made about uh, himself. I remember this now. I said like, I am your sister and I am a student. Exactly. And so the first I am statement of Jesus is that we're gonna look at is in John 6, 35. And in John 6, 35, it says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall never be hungry, and whoever believes in me shall never be thirsty. Okay, yeah, so silly me, that's the bread we're talking about, obviously, yes. like the I am the bread of life. Yes. If I'm being honest though, Julia, mm -hmm. um, it's not so clear to me right now what that means. I'm a little confused is what Jesus is actually talking about when uh. he describes himself as bread. Yeah. Maybe do you think we could read a bit of context around there to see what he might mean by bread of life? Yeah, Madeline, that's a great idea. So Kids Questers, grab a Bible, turn to John 6, chapter 6, verse 22, and let's take a look at the story. John! Chapter 6, verse 22. <sighs> One day, Jesus, hey all, and his disciples, yoo-hoo, were out in the country, and large crowds were following him. Hey! Paw Patrol to the rescue! Wrong show, Marshall. <laughs> It was getting late, and people were starting to get hungry, like me. Grumble, 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 look at my tongue. I'm starving. Yeah, I'm pretty hungry too, Jesus. 
So Jesus took a loaf of bread from a little boy, whoop, and turned it into enough food to feed 5,000 people. Everyone was satisfied and happy because they had seen a miracle and their tummies were full. Mm. I can't have another bite. I'm sure you Kids Questers have heard that story before. But there's a part two. Jesus hey and his disciples, yoo -hoo! they left the crowds and crossed over the Sea of Galilee. And the next day, whoop, the crowds came looking for Jesus again because what could be better than seeing a miracle and getting free food? Am I right? Where is Jesus? Where is that guy? Because I'm getting hungry. Wanna, wanna, wanna. So they crawled the to the rescue. They got Long in. Commercial. <laughs> so they piled into boats and also crossed the Sea of Galilee. And went <laughs> to a town called Capernaum, where. Who did they see none other than Jesus? Hey all! When they saw Jesus, they said, Oh, Jesus, we've been looking all over for you. When did you get here? And Jesus said, You've been looking all over for me very hard, but not because you believe in me, but because you're hoping I'll give you free food. Am I right? Well, duh. Then the people said, um, well, if you gave us free food again, maybe then we'll believe in you. Jesus said, you need bread from heaven that will feed your souls, not bread for your stomachs. So then the people said, okay, give us food from heaven. Then Jesus told them something really important. God has given you bread from heaven. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will not hunger, and whoever drinks from me will never be thirsty. Whoa. Wow. Jesus' I am statements make so much more sense when you see the whole story. Totally. The people in the crowd were looking for earthly bread, bread that would fill our stomachs. They thought that this was going to be the bread that would satisfy them. But Jesus lets them in on a bit of a secret. That bread's not going to satisfy. The bread that they need that will leave them fully satisfied is Jesus. It's being in relationship with Jesus. That's why Jesus is the bread of life. We need him to be truly satisfied. Yeah, Madeline. But... If I'm being honest, sometimes I'm like the people who are following Jesus, part of the crowd. I turn to earthly bread, name brand clothing, compliments from friends, approval from people I look up to, and yes, sometimes even earthly bread, earthly food, to feel satisfied mm -hmm. instead of turning to Jesus, the bread of life, who I know is the only one who can truly satisfy me. I know, Julia. That's me too. So I need a challenge. Kids Questers, do you think we should challenge ourselves this week? Something to do with filling ourselves up with actually satisfying food? You know what? I think it would be cool to memorize scripture this week, to feed ourselves with truth from God's word. So we're gonna memorize Isaiah 55, verse three. Ready, everybody stand up. Ready? Listen closely to me and you will eat what is good. Let's try that one again. Ready? Listen closely to me and you will eat 
what is good. You will enjoy the food that satisfies your soul. Awesome, let's try that one more time. You will enjoy the food that satisfies your soul. All right, let's put the whole thing together. Are you ready? Listen closely to me and you will eat what is good. You will enjoy the food that satisfies your soul. Awesome. So make sure you practice that verse this week. See you next week, Kids Questers. See you next week.27, verse 2 to 24. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, 
he was seized with remorse and returned the 30 silver coins to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us, they replied. That is your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, it is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. That is why it has been called the field of blood to this day. Then what was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet was fulfilled. They took the 30 silver coins, the price set on him by the people of Israel, and they used them to buy the potter's field as the Lord commanded me. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Yes, it is as you say, Jesus replied. When he was accused by the chief priests and the elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, don't you hear the testimony they are bringing against you? But Jesus made no reply, not even to a single charge to the great amazement of the governor. Now it was the governor's custom at the feast to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew it was out of envy that they had handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judge's seat, his wife sent him this message. Don't have anything to do with that innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you, asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called Christ? Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. Why? What crime has he committed, asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, crucify him. When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead of an uproar was starting, he took water and washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood. It is your responsibility. Everyone wants to succeed. I have yet to meet anyone who hopes to fail. I don't know of anyone who wants to start a business hoping that it would end in bankruptcy. I don't know of anyone who coaches a team hoping to lose. I don't know of anyone who enters grad school hoping to flunk out. I don't know of a mechanic who fixes a vehicle only for it to break down the next day. I don't know of anyone who enters a life with Jesus hoping to end up rejecting him. We all want to succeed. We're programmed to succeed. We live in a world that succeeding is difficult. Obstacles end up in our paths. We encounter opposition. People fight us, harm us, and work against us. Sometimes our quest for success runs counter to the quest of others for success. Sparks fly. Threats are made. These are difficult moments. It's our decisions in these moments that seem to shape the very essence of who we are and what we're going to be. As the cross casts its shadow, it exposes the heart of a man who is feeling the squeeze of a decision just like us. Of all the people connected to the crucifixion of Jesus, none of them should surprise him less than Pilate. 
I would say that Pontius Pilate, his presence in these events is focused on a question that he asks. He stands before the crowd with Jesus on one side of him and the criminal Barabbas on the other side and asks the greatest question of all time. What should I do with Jesus? As the shadow of the cross falls on him, the question is at the heart of his presence in this story. So often we read a biblical narrative where we're looking for an answer to the question, who's good and who's bad? We have a tendency to do with them exactly what we do with others. Place them into a category so that we can either support them or condemn them. We like doing this because the alternative is to realize that every human being is more complex than we want to admit. This is Pilate. Pilate doesn't have the greatest reputation, but the image of the gospel paints of Pilate is not an evil person, but rather a man who is wrestling with a life decision. He doesn't deny that Jesus is innocent. He's actually pretty connected to a desire for justice. He sees through the thin veneer of the religious leader's accusations. He does everything he can do to do what is right. He does everything he can think of to let Jesus go free. If he were evil, he wouldn't care about doing right or wrong. He wouldn't care about evil people harming an innocent man. But he does care. Ironically, Pilate is not nearly as heartless and callous as the religious leaders. They seem to have no qualms about framing Jesus. Pilate seems to go through a great struggle in making his decision. In this world today of social media, freedom talk from behind a screen, what if we stop treating each other as if anyone who disagrees with us is an enemy? What if we acknowledge that our opinions are different? What if we acknowledge that we feel strongly about our thoughts and opinions, but rather than seeing those who see it differently as an enemy to be crushed, we thought of them as people who are far more nuanced and intricate and complex than we typically give them credit. What if we treated them the way that we want them to treat us? Hear me, I am not advocating for abandonment of our perspectives. I'm not advocating that we act like we all agree even though we don't. I'm advocating for a mindset to see others as children of God, needy children of God, just like we are. Pilate tries to release Jesus, innocent, but the religious leader's threat strikes at the heart of his life. His interview with Jesus convinces him that this man standing before him is innocent. Pilate is accustomed to the accused claiming innocence. This man says nothing. Matthew 27, 14 says, Jesus made no response of any of the charges, much to the governor's surprise. Or as other translation has it, Pilate was greatly amazed, very impressed. Pilate is wavering. Pilate is teetering. He knows Jesus is innocent, and he's battling within himself what to do. He should release him. He wants to release him. He's about ready to release him. His mind is racing in an attempt to do this in such a way that he isn't the scapegoat. When he finds out that Jesus is from Galilee, he sends Jesus back to Herod, who is over that area. Well, unfortunately, that didn't work. Herod sends him right back. Eventually, Pilate comes out and says, I can't find anything wrong with him. I'm going to let him go. But he backs up when the crowd seems to be on the verge of a riot. Eventually, he comes up with a plan of giving the people an option. I don't know if Pilate really believes that the people will buy it, but he's got to try this. He says to his aide, 
Who's the worst prisoner we've got? Who's somebody that the people fear and hate? The aide says, Barabbas. Pilate says, he's the worst? They all hate him? They're glad he's locked up? They would love to see him get what's coming to him? The aide says, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Okay, go get him, Pilate says. Then Pilate stands up in front of the crowd and reminds them that a Passover tradition is to release a Jewish prisoner. I suspect that they typically release guys who are, have tax fraud or maybe a petty theft. But now Pilate is playing his ace in the hole, Barabbas. It's his hidden advantage. Barabbas is a murderer, and who wants a murderer released? Barabbas is one of those guys you never want to meet in a dark alley or make him angry. He's infamous for his crimes. He stands up with Barabbas and Jesus and asks the people, Do you want me to release Jesus Barabbas or Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews? He's thinking, I am a genius. But the crowd says, Give us Barabbas! And dumbfounded, Pilate says, well, What do you want me to do with Jesus? And the people began to chant, Crucify him! Crucify him! Crucify him! Mark's Gospel says, So to appease the crowd, Pilate releases Barabbas to them. He ordered Jesus flogged, and turned him over to the soldiers to be crucified. But he knows it's wrong. He knows that he's condemning an innocent man. It's bothering him. But he's so wrapped up in power and position and wealth that he can't bring himself to do what is right. So he does what he considers the next best thing, shift the blame. He has a basin of water and a towel brought out to him. And in front of everyone, he washes his hands and then declares, I am washing my hands of this whole thing. I am not responsible for an innocent man's death. That's on all of you. It's on your heads and not mine. And all of the people cry out, we'll take it. Let his blood be on our heads and on the heads of our children. I don't know if Pilate truly feels any better, though. I suspect that he doesn't. I suspect that he knows it was an empty gesture. When we are caught in the web of success as our focus, we found, find all kinds of ways to justify our behavior. We find all kinds of ways to put the responsibility of our decisions on others. But ultimately, it's on us. All of us live with our choices, whether we like it or not. Pilate's wife had a dream, and it seems to be a love note to Pilate. Do you really want to do this? You know the truth. Will you do what you know is right? It's not too late. I realize that it's a difficult decision, but it's really a choice you want to make. Jesus came to reconcile God with his creation. Pilate ends up right in the middle of this story. But Pilate isn't a pawn of God. He's being tempted to be a pawn of Satan. God is trying to help Pilate see himself for who he really is, to give him one more opportunity to stop and think and see where this is headed. I think God provides those opportunities to us as well. Those moments when anger is rising up in you, you feel justified. You feel righteous outrage. And then there's a delay. Traffic backs up. The phone rings. You can't find your keys. The kids need you. In those moments of delay, you have the opportunity to stop and think. You hear that still, small voice. Are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to say that in that way? You know how this is going to change everything. Is there a better way, a more productive way, a saner way? If you hit send, you can't get it back. 
One reason we follow the voice of these idols is quite frankly, it's much easier. It's much easier to live from a perspective of ease and comfort, of pleasure and power and self than a cross. Dostoevsky says this, without God, everything is possible. What he seems to be saying by this is that without God, one can do whatever one pleases. If God is removed from our focus, then we can act, live, think, and be any way we want to. Without God to ground all of our actions in what is right and wrong, we become the basis of what is right and wrong. Flannery O'Connor says, what people don't realize is how much religion costs. They think faith is like a big electric blanket, when of course it is a cross. Here's the thing about the cost of the cross. Sometimes we choose a pathway of least resistance because we can see good coming from it, not just for us, but for others. Sometimes our most difficult struggle is a choice of doing good versus doing what is right. Sometimes it's the same thing, and sometimes it's not. So let's be honest. Lots of people do good. You don't have to be a Christian to do good. Being a Christian isn't about doing good. It's about doing what is right, about following Jesus, about surrendering to Jesus, about obeying God, no matter what. We don't have to go looking for opportunities to sacrifice position and power, to be inconvenienced for the good of others, for what is right. They come to us every single day. We make decisions thinking about ourselves and ignoring the needs of others because it doesn't impact us. Giving up my time for someone that is going to inconvenience me. How do we justify doing these things? We convince ourselves that our time is more important than others. That our money is more important than others. That our energy is more important than others. Galatians 5.24 says, Those who belong to Christ Jesus have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to the cross and crucified them there. Pilate is afraid to risk his political appointment, the power, the money, perhaps even his life. What he can't see is that in the shadow of the cross, all of the world's rewards lose their appeal in the light of the reward of heaven. That is Jesus' perspective. This is why he can go to the cross and remain on the cross. He knows that what he loses will be rewarded. Giving up position and power to do what is right may cost us now, but it creates eternal reward. The cross makes this possible. Philippians 2, 5-11 says, Jesus is exalted because he is unwilling to let holding on to position and power shape his decision-making, even though he has every right to hold on to it. And Paul goes on to say, have this mind in you. You can only stand in the shadow if you have trust. Otherwise, why would you want to be there? Only dark and cold. In the darkness, shadow, stillness, we are most uncomfortable, is where we do our best work. In the shadow of the cross, we see the silhouette of Christ. The shadow of the cross exposes our motives and calls us to choose what is right, even if it costs us position and power. George MacDonald says this, The Son of God suffered unto death, not that men might not suffer, but that their suffering might be like his. As the shadow of the cross falls on us, we are faced with the decision, what shall we do with Jesus? As a follower of Jesus, it's at the heart of every decision we make. Let's pray together. Our loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that your word is alive and active. And we can understand how it can relate to us today. As we see 
the shadow of the cross. We want to see the silhouette of your son, Jesus Christ. We want our lives to be more of a reflection of him. That if we look at every decision we make, may we see the shadow and reflection of Jesus beside us in your light radiating through us as the Holy Spirit guides us and directs us every day. God, I know it's a struggle to make decisions that will impact our life every day, that might impact our family, our work, our church life. But God, when we choose you, when we choose the way of Christ, that is the right decision that is the right way, and you've given us the right choice. So God, as a church, I pray that we collectively come together as a body of believers, and we understand the decisions that we make need to reflect your Son, Jesus Christ, and be honoring to you. So be with us as we travel this road to the cross in this Lent season, that we understand the cost that you gave us your son, Jesus Christ, and he cost his life for us. We know the end of the story. But may, may this be a time of reflection. May this be a time of revealing in us what needs to change.